Hey everyone, it's the Kung Fu Genius, aka Alex Richter. And if you're listening to us on audio only, I'd appreciate you rating and reviewing the podcast wherever you listen to it. And of course, if you like what I do here, don't forget to subscribe to the Kung Fu Genius on YouTube and hit that bell for notifications. Are you a fan of Wing Chun Kung Fu? Well, if you listen to me, I assume you are. I got great news for Kung Fu Genius fans. Right now, you can get an all access one month free trial subscription to Wing Chun Illustrated Magazine. Yes, I said free. Go to wcinewsstand.com and register in the upper right hand corner fill in your email and password and use the code kfg trial to get your free trial to the issues from 2011 to the current issue that's right all the issues even the one with this guy on the cover my kung fu genius column is in all the new issues as if you need another reason to get this awesome magazine go get your free trial subscription today for all that information check out the description below and with that let's get started all right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from YouTube. Lots of gems, lots of Bruce Lee giving up on Wing Chun, lots of my dad can totally be Jackie Chan's ass, so you better listen to him. Let's get to it. He is unstoppable, unbeatable, unbelievable. He's Alex Richter, the Kung Fu Genius. And every day, I practice martial arts. <laughs> Word is, I'm a Kung Fu Genius. Practice all day like a genius. Yo, Dre, how you doing, man? Sifu, I'm feeling fantastic today. How are you? It's a nice day today. It's like, you know... It's we, gorge out. My, yeah, it's my gorge. My would say. Yeah. It's gorge. It's like one of those... The, the weather is slowly changing a little bit. It's not super warm, but it's nice. It's way better than it's been. It's nice when the weather changes in New York. It's the like energy that, changes. That, really pre, great. that pre-spring. That pre Yeah, pre-spring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's Spring Love by Stevie B. <laughs> Getting in the air. That song's going to start playing. Oh, no. I'm a blast in the cat. I'm a blast in the cat. You know what later. blows me away? Like I, would, like, I had to listen to Stevie B a lot in the 80s because, like, that he was, like, the shit back then, right? Yeah. And, like, he hasn't done anything in a long time. I have more Twitter followers than Stevie B. That blows me away. No. Yeah. I'm like, no. what What a sad state of affairs for Stevie <laughs> B, right? He needs, he needs to re-release Spring Love. I and, would like him to perform that song here. Yeah, one day just come roll I in. Think I'm, I'm sure right we can get him. On, I'm sure we can get him on this podcast <laughs> at this point. <laughs> Performs it and bounce. Ent entice him with our five thousand right. followers. It's like that's a huge <laughs> we audience. May do it. Yeah, yeah let's do we it. Do let's it. do it. So we are doing another Ask Me Anything episode. Oh, so what man. you got for me today? Ooh, first up, we got a uh, Patreon question. Uh huh. Okay. okay. Patreon supporter. Sephora. 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 Patreon Sephora shopper. Uh, uh, so. <laughs> Patreon supporter. Yes. Sifu David Peterson. Sifu David Peterson. Mm. That's a big deal. That's, That's a big like one. Wing Chun royalty right yeah. there. Yeah. Love that. And big shout out, Sifu David Peterson supports us on Patreon, which is love. like amazing. That's all love. It's amazing. Absolutely it's all amazing. buttery. Yeah. Yeah. So if Sifu David Peterson supports us on Patreon, why aren't you supporting us on Patreon? <laughs> yeah. All right. So anyway. Ooh. So ah. what is it? What is it? All right. So Sifu, Sifu, Sifu David Peterson is asking, well, he, he premises with great episode, guys. Awesome. Help me start off my weekend with a big smile. All right. I'm sure he's talking about all your, the episodes your, in your, one. Or your shenanigans, it, actually. It could be. Could be. <laughs> a possible question for a future show. Sifu Alex, what are your thoughts on the claims that Bruce Lee gave up on Wing Chun? When personal training notes from the period close to his death are full of Wing Chun references. Oh. Yeah. Not to mention that the last article he wrote for Black Belt magazine was on Wing Chun. That's true. Seems contradictory to me. Yeah. And me. Yeah. But if I'd like to hear your take on this. But I'd like to hear your take on this. Not if. That's a, that's a fantastic question. And mm. what an honor for me to... Get a question by Sifu David Peterson. Wow. That's pretty awesome. Wow. Um, yeah, so th there's been like in Jeet Kune Do lore, mm. this um, kind of accepted idea that towards the end of Bruce Lee's life, that he had essentially given up mostly, if not entirely, on Wing Chun. And that he was kind of full steam ahead with his Jeet Kune Do ideas or perhaps going in, you know, further into a direction that moves him away from Wing Chun. I I never quite bought into that, but that is a pretty prevalent narrative among some strains of Jeet Kune Do. Mm. So 
it's it's possible. The problem is that that part of Bruce Lee's life, that last part, he was in Hong Kong making films. So during that time period, he was not really actively teaching Jeet Kune Do. So he was, you could almost say okay. he was kind of retired from teaching because he was making films at that time. He did teach like Sam Hoy, who's like a, a very famous um, Cantonese pop singer who also became like a comedic actor, a very young Sam, Sam Hoy um, is uh, very famous in Hong Kong because he's like one of like the um, most iconic Hong Kong Cantonese pop stars. Oh, wow. And in the early 70s, he was like up and coming and him and his brothers made a bunch of movies. They made comedies. Uh, one most notably called Private Eyes, which is like my favorite. If you okay. ever like kind of like old goofy Hong Kong comedies, Private Eyes is like pretty amazing. But Sam okay. Hoi was, um, was kind of coming into his own around the time that Bruce Lee was making films in Hong Kong and, and he knew him. I believe that there was also some connection maybe with one of Sam's older brothers also went to LaSalle um, High School like Bruce Lee. Uh, and right. um, Sam's wife, I think her name is Reba, was very close to Linda. So Sam Hoy was learning some martial arts from Bruce Lee in Hong Kong. Um, but I, I don't, there's nothing to indicate that what Bruce was teaching Sam was anything more than like throwing some sidekicks on the heavy bag and, and cool. doing some stuff that might be useful for films as opposed to him teaching him like day one, this is Jeet Kune Do step by step, right? Uh, so as far as I know, and I can be totally wrong on this, and I'm welcome to being corrected by anyone who has more information than I do on this topic. For that time period, let's say late 71, once Bruce goes over to Hong Kong to make Big Boss, he was, for all intents and purposes, retired from teaching Jeet Kune Do, all right? So he was... How long was that period, you said? Well, he, he made Big Boss in 71. Mm -hmm. so it was like middle end 71, I think. But two years. And uh, he already essentially relocated over to Hong Kong, although he still had his house in L.A., but he eventually sold it. And he stayed at the apartment in Ho Man Tin until he got his Kowloon Tong mansion. Mm -hmm. He was actually in a normal-ass Hong Kong apartment while he made Big Boss and I think most of Fist of Fury. He was living like in a normal Hong Kong apartment in Ho Man Tin, like a nothing okay. special, small ass Hong Kong apartment. Right. This like big movie star, right? And then after, I think after Fist of Fury, shortly after, or maybe around that time, then he got the 41 Cumberland Road mansion, right? But you have to imagine, I mean, he was making films at that time. So he was not earning any money teaching Jeet Kune Do. I mean, maybe he was getting some residuals or kickbacks from the schools back in the States, but I think they had, they had mostly closed his schools at that point. So, mm. uh, so I don't know what the arrangement was, but he was, like I said, for all intents and purposes, retired from teaching Jeet Kune Do, which is why we don't really know a whole, like, it's interesting. Um, the the part of Bruce Lee's life, which brought the most amount of attention to Bruce Lee, namely the time that he made those films in Hong Kong, which is from 71 and he dies in summer of 73. So this is all very, this all happens very fast. Mm. I think sometimes it, people don't realize um, how short of a time that was, you know, from the time that he made um, Fists of Fury to the time Enter the Dragon came out and he had already it had been passed away for, for a few weeks. I mean, you're looking, this is two years, Dre. Wow. This is two years. So wow. you have to imagine we're in 2022 right now and the pandemic started to hit in. F so yeah, it's around the, the same time of, two, of 2020. So you have to imagine since the pandemic, since the, we first went into lockdown, yeah. that was Bruce Lee's entire career. And then he died. Wow. You have to imagine how fast it is. I think it's like because we look at all this stuff and his great body of work. And I think, you know, one of the reasons why I like why I can remember a lot of facts about him is because my my brain works in timelines. Mm. And that's a very, very short timeline. So in that time period when he was making all those movies, he was not, from my understanding, teaching Jeet Kune Do. Now, mind you, he was obviously practicing martial arts. A lot of what we know about his training routines, his physical training routines, do also come from that period where he was using the Marcy machine, the type of strength training he was doing. Um, but because he wasn't teaching Jeet Kune Do at that time, I mean, maybe when Ted Wong came to visit him uh, to put the Marcy machine together in Hong Kong, maybe they did some lessons or whatever. But I mean, for the... 
the, the, we don't know what Bruce was thinking about Jeet Kune Do during the time that he became the most famous. Because mm. most of what we know about Jeet Kune Do and what he had written in his notes, that was before Hong Kong. Uh, most wow. most of what his students say he was doing that even Dan and Asanto that was before his time in Hong Kong because he was not teaching at that time he was a movie star yeah. so we actually don't really know had Bruce Lee continued to make films had he not passed away um, would he have continued to he, I'm sure he would have continued to develop his body he would have continued to train um, but would he have been so concerned with what Jeet Kune Do was or wasn't if he's not really actively teaching it. So I don't know. These are things we don't know. So the question is, so did Bruce Lee abandon Wing Chun in that final period? And I have to say, I think it's one of those things that's unknown and unknowable, partially mm -hmm. because whether he had given it up or not, that would only have been in his head because since he wasn't teaching it, there were no students to say Bruce was no longer doing Wing Chun in this time period because he wasn't teaching anyone. So who would know that? I think it falls under the category of unknown and unknowable. Hmm. Clearly, there was an evolution in his training over time to perhaps do a little bit less of the Wing Chun stuff or take some of the Wing Chun stuff and integrate it with the footwork that he used from fencing to close the gap with maybe some ideas from boxing and some other martial arts that he pulled from. But even Dan and Asanto is quoted as saying that whenever Bruce got serious about a fight, he always reverted back to Wing Chun. So I think that there might also be a dichotomy of when someone is really good at something and they have it as a tool and that tool is really solid. Mm -hmm. They can not focus on it anymore because they're focusing on other things, but they always have that tool in their back pocket. Yeah. So it's possible that even if Bruce Lee had, quote unquote, given up on Wing Chun, meaning that he wasn't, and that could mean maybe he was not interested in learning more of it, or he wasn't interested in exploring, exploring more of it because maybe he felt that what he had gotten from it mm -hmm. is about all he's ever going to get from it, and it was good enough for him to keep it and to use it, but for him maybe to say, I don't need any more of it, right? These are these are all these are the kind of thought experiments that, you know, when people when you the question came the other day, who would I want to talk to, a young Bruce Lee or an older Bruce Lee and have right. a conversation with? I would want to talk to that older Bruce Lee and have this conversation. Mm -hmm. What were his current thoughts on Wing Chun in martial arts and evolution? Because these are the things we don't know, because he wasn't writing a lot of notes on martial arts in the time period shortly preceding his death, which was literally the entire time he was making films because all of that was very short. So we don't know. Now, uh, as Sifu Peterson mentioned, the last article he wrote for Black Belt Magazine um, was about Wing Chun. Mm. And that article came out in 1969. So it's still about two years before he would depart for Hong Kong. So it, it, it's also possible... See, the thing is that we don't know. Like The fact that he wrote an article about Wing Chun so late, uh, it, the article was called um, The Chi Sao of Wing Chun, and basically wrote an article about Chi Sao in Black Belt Magazine, 1969, for, I think, for their yearbook edition. And later, there was another article in, in Black Belt Magazine. It was a cover article. It had James E.M. Lee on the cover. It's basically the same cover as the Wing Chun Green Book that Bruce Lee authored well, technically co-authored with James M. Lee, although he really wrote the book. And that was on the cover, but that article wasn't written by Bruce Lee. And that article was in, I think, September of 72, or no, no, maybe earlier, March or February. Um, and it mentions Leung Teng as the successor to Yip Man in that Black Belt magazine article. Mind you, Yip Man was still alive at that time. Okay. And obviously the article has some references to, to Bruce Lee's students. Interesting, um, Leung Teng told me a story that Tang Sang, our, our pr the proverbial Tang Sang, yeah. had gotten that magazine uh, while on a trip to the States and showed it to Yip Man and said, like, oh, look, they just wrote an article about you in Black Belt magazine wow. because it was all about Yip Man. And they mentioned Leung Ting in there as a successor and they showed it to Yip Man. And, and um, Leung Ting said he, he, he found it very interesting because he didn't know who the author was. So, like, how did this author get any information about who even Leung Ting was in Hong Kong, right? Um, and it mentioned Bruce Lee and so on. And Leung Ting had a copy of this magazine. In fact, he put it in Roots of Wing Chun. And he had an old shabby cover. And he 
uh, I actually found a, a, a mint version of that magazine for him on eBay. Okay. And I, I bought it for him and I gave it to him. And then in his Roots of Wing Chun book, so for Wing Chun nerds out there, if you see the first edition of Roots of Wing Chun, where he shows that, that Black Belt magazine that mentions him as the successor to Yip Man or whatever, the, the cover is uh, James M. Lee and it's really ratty. And then in like the second or third printing, it's a new cleaner cover. And that's the version <laughs> I gave him. All right. All right. And then he's like, oh, you're so sure this is a real, like I gave it to him. He, he thought it was like, it wasn't even that expensive. I got uh -huh. it on eBay maybe for 30 bucks or something like that. Okay. And then he's like, but don't you want to have a copy of it? And I had bought two. I bought two. The guy had two copies okay. of it. So I, I still have my version of it. But again, it doesn't really mention Bruce Lee. So what, what did Bruce Lee think of Wing Chun? Well, he thought of it enough to use it in some of the choreography. He used some Wing Chun in Enter the Dragon, right? Especially against... Uh, the, the late Bob Wall. Mm -hmm. um, he used uh, s some of it in Way of the Dragon. There were a couple beats there with uh, Chuck Norris where you see just like Paxau and Lapsau and a couple chain punches. And uh, there are a couple phrases of that in his fight with Bob Baker in uh, Fists of Fury. And not really any Wing Chun that I can tell in uh, Big Boss. Um, but for the most part, he still used it in his choreography. Now, does that mean... See, the problem is we still don't know. The fact that Bruce Lee used some Wing Chun in his choreography doesn't mean that he... He could have given up on Wing Chun as a martial art and still liked it for the choreography. Like, right, right. like it doesn't prove that he was still into Wing Chun because he used it. I think, I think we just don't really know. Um, he obviously was very fond of Wing Chun for a very long time, and Wing Chun was a huge part of his thought process and how he... How he Developed Jeet Kune Do would not have been developed the way it was if not for Wing Chun, if not for Yip Man's influence, if not for Wong Sun Lung's influence. Because Wing Chun as a martial art is 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 very much about like let's figure out what works and let's let's do that, and it's a lot less dogmatic than the more traditional martial arts, um, for the most part. Uh, there are many exceptions in Wing Chun, but Wing Chun is kind of more about results. Like Sammo Hung in Prodigal Son, where he's training Yun Bu's uh, Leung Jan, and then he boom he gives him a headbutt and. Mm -hmm. Yun Bu yeah. is like, Sifu, is this Wing Chun? And he goes, who cares, as long as I win. Right? Oh, yes. And that's, for me, it's kind of like, that's kind of Wing Chun. That's the most Wing Chun line in Prodigal Son. Oh, yeah. Who cares as long as I win, right? So when you look at how a lot of the Wing Chun Sifus think, and it's very pragmatic for, especially for a traditional Chinese martial art, you cannot help but see how much Jeet Kune Do is influenced just by that idea alone, right? Okay. So I... I just don't. It's a great question, yeah. and I and you know I, I I've now spent the greater part of fifteen minutes talking about how I basically don't know the answer. <laughs> but, but this is exactly this is exactly the kind of thing that I would like to have talked to Bruce Lee about, right? And the thing well, is, well, he just wants to hear your take on it. Yeah, my take is that yeah. I really uh, I I I think that Bruce Lee still would use Wing Chun in his back pocket in the toolkit. I think mm -hmm. if because you always revert back to that thing that you do best. All right. Which is why sometimes like if uh, students do sparring too early, if they came from another martial art, let's say someone did years of karate oh, and, yeah. and, and you do Wing Chun and they're doing Wing Chun for a month and a half. And then they go into like a full on sparring class. Like we've seen in gauntlets. Yeah. Some people and, will and, and, grapple a lot. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes like if, if suddenly they get into that amygdala hijack where their brain is like, OK, I'm in stress mode now. They revert back to what they did before. So that's why usually when people are learning a new martial art, you you want to make sure they have enough time getting comfortable with the techniques before you start pressure testing it. Otherwise, it's just going to revert back to what they did before. Mm -hmm. um, even the, the Gracie Academy in Los Angeles is very adamant about that. There's essentially no sparring at the white belt level because you got to learn all these techniques, do them in simulations. And then once you get your blue belt, now you can start really sparring with it. But if you do it too prematurely, you, you don't have the motor skills to do it, right? So um, you can imagine that no matter what Bruce was developing in his Jeet Kune Do or whatever, that if things went, if shit hit the fan, I would be very hard pressed to think that Bruce wouldn't throw up some chain punches and a Pax out elbow and, and start going back into like, yeah. into the Wing Chun Fight stuff. Mode. Yeah, mm -hmm. because that's just the stuff that he knows so well. So I think that it was still part of his toolkit, even if maybe he might have been exploring other stuff. But yeah, just, we don't really know. So we don't really know. But uh, the one note that uh, uh, Sifu Peterson said about Bruce's wing, uh, notes is that 
in a lot of his notes, when you look at like his Jeet Kune Do stuff that he was drawing, he would he would draw from different sources, different things that he was reading, different books, mm-hmm. fencing, other Asian martial arts. And in the corners, he would often write in Chinese. Like he would write stuff in English. That was normally the the notes on whatever book he was reading. But then he would almost write shorthand in Chinese in the corner. And if you look at a lot of the Chinese stuff, it was almost always about Wing Chun or it was almost always about comparing what that thing that he was writing about in English to Wing Chun. So so if you can read some Chinese and you would look at Bruce's English notes. I can't speak it very well, but I read it fluently. You read perfectly, right? Uh, And you would look at like the stuff he wrote in Chinese on the side. It's almost like end notes or commentary Mm. from Bruce Lee. It's like because it's so much easier for him to write about Wing Chun in Chinese than in English. So anyway, that's a great question. I wish I knew more, but I don't. Man. Man. (laughs) Great question. Man, oh man. What we got next? Good stuff. Next up, we got Voodoo. Uh, This is another Another Patreon Patreon supporter. Patreon supporter, yes. Hello, Sifu, Alex, and Dre. Okay, exclamation point. Sorry. Sorry, Mike. Yeah, I see how it is. (laughs) What, What do you think about Bruce Lee's critique of Wing Chun's footwork? Oh, another one. Straight into the Bruce Lee. Now, was this due to l- not learning the whole system? Or do you think he was right with his alterations? Does the WT lineage footwork resolve these issues? And then he has another one okay. right after. I we, we have discussed similar things to this in the past. So, um, well, it's, it's very difficult because um, footwork and how you move is always contextual to... The martial art you're practicing and w- how you're going to use that martial art. Okay, so if you are on a rooftop in Hong Kong and you're fighting someone who comes from another traditional Chinese martial arts background, and you stand in front of them in your traditional Zhong Cell, mm. and uh, you're just you're 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 right on there, and you all you need to do is just wait for that moment when they take a step and you spoom and you storm in and you swarm them. If that is your paradigm of fighting, then you don't need anything else other than Wing Chun footwork. Uh All right. If someone stands in front of you, you know, and they're talking ish and they take a swing, which is actually how most assaults are going to happen. You know, you're standing there, you're trying to get the guy to calm down and suddenly he throws a swing at you, boom, and you're in there. Then you you don't need all this other footwork stuff. I think that there's always the, the problem is that. When people say like, oh, Wing Chun footwork is this, and then Bruce had to add this footwork and change this or whatever, there's always an assumption that we're talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. And we're not, okay? Because if someone stands in front of you and they're screaming at the top of their lungs and they're aggressive and you put your, your fence up and you're going, yo, man, take it easy. What's going on? And that dude suddenly starts to get violent, Okay. Okay. There is no bouncing back and forth, measuring the distance. I'm going to give you a feint to see how you react. Okay, every time I give you this feint, you uh, lower your your right hand. So I'm going to give you a feint and then pop you with a left hook because I see that you lower your hand. Uh That is a totally different idea of fighting. Okay, if you're going to fight in the ring or you're going to fight in a more sportive idea. Okay, where we're going to start at distance. We're going to have essentially have a duel um, where we we put gloves on, we touch gloves and we back we go back and forth. Well, then, yeah, the traditional Wing Chun footwork is not for that thing. Mm. And if you try to use it in that thing, like that idiot Deng Hao who fought Xu Xiaodong or whatever, you're going to have problems because that's not what it's suited for. If you're going to have a back and forth with someone in a more sportive sparring way, and I don't say sport in a, I'm not trying to like diss it. I'm saying in that kind of more sporty kickboxing frame of doing things, then you need to have footwork that, allows you to move and, and check distance and have all and you know add feints and things like that and, and bait the guy to come in or whatever see what see what the reactions are and then choose your tactic to go and fell this opponent which could be different based on the type of opponent you have in front of you when someone just stands in front of you screaming at the top of lungs it takes a swing at you none of that stuff about fighting measure and distance and timing and the jab and how does he react to the jab and I'm yeah. going to use a one-two to open him up on this line and then give him a low shot. None of that stuff matters because the guy's in front of you and suddenly he's swarming the piss out of you yeah. and it's like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I'm supposed to test the distance with my jab first and see what you do before we actually get into hey, it. No, hey, hey. dude just runs up to you and grabs you. Dude runs up to you, takes a swing. So when we talk about Wing Chun footwork is this and Jeet Kune Do footwork is that, are we talking about what fighting situation are we talking about? Yeah. If Bruce knew how to fight another Kung Fu guy on a rooftop 
And Bruce knew that if someone was standing in front of him and took a swing, boom, he had that real quick reaction. Mm -hmm. And he wants to continue to improve himself as a martial artist. Well, what's the next thing he's going to want to do? He's also going to want to master the art of going back and forth and distance and timing and rhythm and all of that stuff at distance in that more kind of sportive way. And I'm not saying sport fighting in a derogatory way, the most the way most traditional martial arts people talk about. I'm saying in that kind of back and forth kickboxing, boxing kind of frame where we're going back and forth and we're testing with jabs and stuff. He wanted to also be good at that, too. So he needed to develop that skill set. All right. But I will tell you, all right, if some dude is in your face at a bar yeah. and decides to shove you and take a swing, you just need to have footwork that allows you to step in and go forward. So, again, it's always cross purposing. We're not talking about the same thing. Mm. All right. Cool. Yeah. Next question. Uh, well, he, he oh, has a two part. Yeah, his next question. And here. hello, C4 Alex and Dre. What modern training equipment, speed bag, heavy bag, angled heavy bag, wrecking ball bag, double end bag, etc., do you think would be best benefit a Wing Chun home gym? Well, I don't think there's any such thing as best because it depends on the practitioner, depends on their skill set uh, or lack thereof, right? So someone who is lacking power and wants to develop power, I would recommend equipment that would be good for developing power heavier bags mm. i like the teardrop bag the muay thai teardrop bag we have plus, one upstairs plus their their layout of their crib you know has right something to do with it absolutely i like the teardrop bag yeah. for kicks and knees but it's not very good for chain punches because mm -hmm. it's got kind of a bottleneck at the top yeah. right but for uh, elbows kicks and knees it's really good because it's very strong uh, it's very heavy i should say um Standard Muay Thai bag is really good for, you know, doing the low line straight kick and chain punching. But because that bag goes all the way to the floor, you cannot insert your leg close enough. So you're still kind of punching at it instead of punching through it. Yeah. So that's why I also like the shorter heavy bags where you can step into it and almost underneath it. Mm. Uh, double end bags are really great for speed. But again, if someone was lacking power, they should probably hit something with a little bit more heft. If someone had power, but they were lacking finesse and needed speed, then you get a speed bag, like right? like me. Exactly. Yeah. All right. You have way too much power, way too much power. but not enough finesse. <laughs> <laughs> zero finesse. Uh, yeah. So, so zero? yes. So, uh, you know, <laughs> I, again, it's, it's very difficult because people like these absolute answers. All right. Like this is the best equipment. Absolutely. Right. Uh, you know, this was the problem with Wing Chun footwork that, that, you know, that Bruce Lee solved or didn't solve or whatever. Like these things are way more gray mm. and it depends on what you like. I'm, I'm a nerd. I have pretty much every piece of equipment under the sun. I like traditional stuff like the, the sandbags, the wall bags. Mm -hmm. I like heavy bags. I like Muay Thai bags, teardrop bags. We have a, we have a double end speed bag upstairs, but it's the Mexican speed bag yeah. shaped like a peanut. So you have the two, the two bits to it, peanut bag. which is, which is really awesome. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there's a, what was that bag Bruce Lee is kicking? Is how much did that weigh? It's a big bag. <laughs> yeah, he had he had like a huge canvas, canvas bag. bag. I think it was originally for like football players to practice tackling on or something oh, nice. like that. Yeah, but but that, that's so one of those things. Thick. Yeah, that's one of those. And maybe it weighed three hundred pounds. Yeah. I don't know, two hundred pounds, three hundred pounds. But over time, I remember someone in the comments like, "What about that nine hundred pound bag <laughs> or six hundred pound bag?" <laughs> right, right. It's ridiculous. Like Bruce was amazing. He trained with like some pretty robust pieces of equipment. But there's no need for people just to exaggerate bullshit for the sake of it, right? All right, great question. What do we got great next? Stuff. All right, we got Renee. Awesome. Okay. Hi, Sifu Alex. What do you think about the punching power Wing Chun linear movement versus round throwing movements? When I punch the punching bag with a straight Wing Chun punch combined with a step, I always have the subjective impression that is stronger than a round punch with a full body turn into the bag. The initial impact of the round movement seems to be stronger, but when I use the straight punch, the body when I use the straight punch, the body is aligned with the power line and I can push longer through the target. Okay. That impact I can definitely see on the swing of the bag. Despite other obvious advantages for the straight punch and self-defense, do you think the power of the straight punch is equal to the round power, oh, the round punch or even stronger? Uh-huh. I couldn't find any real research on this punching power topic. Thanks and keep up the good work. Have a good day. 
Uh, great question. Um, yeah, this is the this is one of those eternal like the straight line versus the curved line debates, and mm. it's basically like, all right, well, why don't you solve it, KFG? All right, uh, look. Martial arts are contextual, all right? And how you apply them and how you use them and whether you have power or not is such an individual thing. People, the problem is that martial arts are often talked about in a very black and white kind of way, like as certain things on paper, like it's always going to be this way. Mm. If you do this and do this, this is always going to be the result. And it's not that way at all. I mean, we're human beings applying these things and we're doing them under stress and we don't always apply these things in the best way. And we don't always select the exact right way to respond in a certain situation, which is also going to change the amount of power that you have. So it, yeah, you always have to preface it with it. Like, you know, there are people out there who have murderous straight punches. And Man. there are people out there who have murderous round punches. All right. <laughs> so, I mean, the thing is that you can you can be very strong and powerful with either one of these methods. It's all contextual to how hard you train. I wouldn't rely so much on uh, what it is on paper and then somehow trying to bind yourself to what uh, what you read in a paper, a uh, scientific paper about this versus that. Mm -hmm. All right. You, ultimately, you're the one that's going to have to save your own ass when someone fires a punch at you. Yeah. Right. Hoist Gracie had a great line. He says, um, a black belt covers one inch of your ass. You have to cover the rest. <laughs> <All right? laughs> and, and, and so I always thought that was a really great line. Right. Okay. Um, and, and so the the idea the idea of personal responsibility in martial arts is something that I think gets overlooked when people want to put techniques and methods on a pedestal that they do not deserve. Okay, so the straight the straight line punch when it's done correctly when you use your your body stepping forward and you time it with the joints and everything just right has the potential for a lot of power. But its real advantage is in its efficiency and its ability to frame a uh, uh, to create a frame between you and your opponent that might be trying to charge you mm -hmm. in a way that a swing punch or a round punch, if that punch misses and the guy come in, comes in close, you have nothing in between you and that opponent now. All right. A straight punch, if it doesn't have the full intended effect, can more easily become a frame to keep this guy from trying to grab you and clinch you, which is usually the next thing that happens if you punch someone and don't knock them out. Yeah. They're probably going to try to grab you and clinch you or obviously punch you back, right? So what you have to realize is that it's not a matter of is the straight line punch uh, more powerful than the curve, all right? It's a matter of what is your aim when you're defending yourself, right? Which yeah. he mentioned in there. He understood that. But it's like, yeah, you want to efficiently punch someone really fast and you want to have enough power to either stop them, knock them down or knock them out. Um, but if those things don't happen, you need to have a backup plan that keeps you safe. Yeah. And for Wing Chun fighting, the straight punch fits that bill better because the straight punch can can more easily protect the center line and become a frame if the yeah. punch doesn't have the intended target. I could never target. use the straight punch at work. I right, was, I, was, I was frustrated yeah. with stuff like that. Yeah. I wanted to use it, but right. I had to consciously not use it. Right, right, right. <laughs> it's just framing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because you cannot hit people as a <laughs> bouncer, all right? Yeah. I know you want to, right? Yeah. So, so yeah, it's, it's like, well, if you really put the two of them side by side, mm -hmm. all right, I would say there is probably an edge in curved or round punches because in terms of pure power, because when you can add rotation to a punch, rotation increases the distance within the same amount of movement, you can generate more power. And uh, But that is not the only aim when you're fighting in Wing Chun, all right? Because you can put, you can have the most powerful left hook, and if that thing misses and you're out of position, oh. now you're going to wish you threw a straight punch instead. <laughs> so, And that's not throwing yeah. shade at round or curved punches or anything like that, right? Because, again, it also depends on who's doing it. Right. Yeah. OK, for for every Wing Chun person that can that can punch someone uh, and send them a mile flying with a straight punch is mm. five Wing Chun people who can't. Yeah. OK, so, again, it you have to develop your tools. All right. I can't sit here and say this is going to guarantee it's always going to be more powerful if you punch this way, because I don't know you and I don't know how hard you train. Mm -hmm. All right. So these things are these things are all contextual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Nganu. 
All right, next up we... What? Just, just wondering. <laughs> no, nah, he got some murderous, murderous round punches. Anyway, Carlos Estrella. Yes. Okay. Is asking. All right. A question. <laughs> what else would he be asking? <laughs> would he be asking a statement? <laughs> asking for your hand in marriage. Mm. That would be wicked wild. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wicked man. Live All right. KFG. All right. All right, let's go. How, hows do you tell? All right, how do you tell your teacher that you're learning too much too fast? Oh, and that you want to take more time learning things. Mm -hmm. I.e., you want to learn how to do basic hand movements before jumping right into two-handed chi sao. Right. Whoa. Yeah, so that normally we have the opposite problem, right? You know, right? You, 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 you've been learning and, and uh, the Sifu is slow boating the students or yeah. whatever, right? Um, well, I mean, look, uh, I don't know anything about his Sifu, mm. all right? Is your Sifu an open-minded person yeah. who's willing to accept, you know, suggestions or criticisms from a student and be like, okay, we can do this? Or are they a tyrant that are going to tell you this is this is the only way to do it, right? No. So, again, I, I don't know because um, the, Excuse me. I've not met too many Sifus that are too similar to each other. Right? Every Sifu has their own vibe, the way they like to run things, the way they like to do things. Um, and again, if you feel that you're being pushed too quickly through the curriculum, remember that you can also spend time outside of class practicing those things True. to get really good at them, right? So you, you, you don't only have your time in, in training to get good at it, but you go home and you think about it, you practice it, that's you try to assimilate time. the information. Yeah. It, it actually, that's where the real learning begins because when you're in class, you get the information, you practice it, but when you leave and you go home, and you go through it again. That's the process where your mind is going like, okay, you need to recall the information. You need to think about the corrections. And now you need to do it so you start to assimilate it. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, one of the problems between people who rely a lot on what their teacher teaches them and what they do in class to determine how good they get. All right, Because uh, there are students who have done half the number of classes as mm -hmm. other students. Yeah. But the ones that did half have a way deeper understanding and have way better skills than the people who come to every single class but do not take the time to assimilate the information. And I, I'm starting to develop a bit of a hypothesis. It's quite unscientific because I okay. have not tested it. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to say it's based on completely anecdotal evidence oh, okay. of teaching for the last 20 years. Mm. And there are students who come to class and they do the class this, the Sifu or the teacher is like a motivational speaker. Mm -hmm. And that Sifu teacher like demonstrates stuff and like, wow, that's so cool. And they see that teacher is doing something that is almost like fantastic and outside of their grasp because that is the teacher and they're so good. Mm. So they often attend class almost like going, going to what I would a assume would be like going to a Tony Robbins seminar. Yeah. Okay. And they're there and they're like, wow, look at this one guy. Have you ever been to one All right. of those I seminars? I have not. All right. I've but, been but, to one. but it's the idea of like, look at this one guy yeah. and how amazing they are. And they're like, wow. And they're watching and they're blown away. And then they leave and they go, wow, did you see what he said? Or mm. did you hear what he said? Did you see what he did? That's amazing. And then they go home and 10 minutes later, they're back to doing whatever they were doing before. Mm. So, a large percentage of martial arts students go to martial arts class with some degree of that kind of attitude. They go, they see the teacher, the teacher's amazing, the teacher's good. They almost have like a little show watching the teacher do stuff, maybe getting tossed around in cheese out. And they're like, wow, this is so great. And they're like blown away by it. And then they leave. And then they leave it in the class. They leave it in the class. Mm. And those are the students that I always say are renting their Kung Fu. Because hey, because it's not yours. You kind of it's like you're wearing a suit, but it's a rental. It's not it's not really custom cut. Damn. And so you have to become someone who owns your kung fu. So to a certain degree, without becoming arrogant, or it's, it's not a call to hubris or anything like that. If you don't see yourself as being capable of doing, you know, at some point being able to do the things that your teacher is doing. 
You go like, they're this good because they're 15, 20 years down the road. But I'm on that same road. I'm just further down. And mm -hmm. I'm working to that. And maybe I can do some of those things, not at that level, but I can already do some of those things. You have to see yourself as being able to do it. Mm -hmm. And you have to see yourself as being in a process of getting better. Yeah. Otherwise... You're just showing up to a Tony Robbins seminar and clapping with drool hanging out of your mouth and going, that was amazing. Well, he said lots of amazing things. If only one day I could actually do those things, then I would be like him and they're not going to do it. The student that has success is the student that assimilates the information that they're getting and they compare it to what they learned before and they look for consistencies and inconsistencies and then they train it and they discuss it and they read about it. So that's why outside of class, in my opinion and in my experience, mm -hmm. is where the most amount of learning occurs. Because you go home and you think about what you did and you go like, all right, so today we were doing this thing in BUG and like, all right, this is for this. What are other situations in which I could use that? How does this relate to these other things that I learned? And you go through these mental exercises where you create these spider webs of information and where how all this stuff interconnects. Because all of Wing Chun, in this case, and most martial arts, whether yeah. it's boxing, Jeet Kune Do, whatever, jujitsu they all connect because these are they're based on an idea and these things all spider web from that same idea and the ability to create all those connections and to understand those connections come from how much you think about the stuff you're doing in class outside of class yeah. and you cannot just rely on what you're doing in class to be the only thing that's going to make you good the the thing that determines whether you're good or understand it or can do anything mm -hmm. all right because then then you're not taking personal responsibility for the information, right? So if an instructor happens to be pushing you through something too fast, besides telling the instructor that you would like to slow down, well, why don't you spend all your free time that you have for practicing martial arts outside of the class to getting really good at the stuff that you want to spend more time on? Because then you can be the one spending more time on that stuff while still making some kind of linear progress on the martial art that you're doing. But again, I don't know what this, what Carlos's instructor is like or whatever. So I can't tell you, you got to know how to talk to the big one, the mm. big boss. All right. Yeah. You got to go up to the big boss and be like, look, big boss, <laughs> I cannot do these 10 packs out progressions. Can we just do yeah. the first one uh -huh. for the next eight years? Yeah. And they'll be like, fine. All right. <laughs> Student for life. Hopefully. Hopefully. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next no, one. I, I find that fascinating because when I'm teaching, I always try to say, yeah, when you're practicing at home, yes. when you're practicing this at home, right. this is a good way to practice it. Yes. So they just know that they got to practice it at home or right. elsewhere. Or outside before yeah, class, yeah, after class. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you have to assimilate an, it. Oh, my God. Otherwise, it's not yours. Otherwise, you're just renting your Kung Fu. And you know who actually made that? Um, so I, I'm not, uh, I, I have to admit, I did not, I'm not the originator of that take. Mm. I recently read something by James DeMille. The late James DeMille passed yeah. away last year. So one of the early students of Bruce Lee. His, his kick, he was a, I believe he was a psychologist or he had some training in, in some uh, psychotherapy, something That's like dope. that, right? So okay. he, he would often analyze things from some kind of psychoanalytical perspective. Mm. And of course, he had an odd relationship with Bruce Lee because when Bruce Lee left Seattle, I think that there was a little bit of bad blood between James DeMille and Bruce because they had kind of broken away and there was some stuff going on, right? So I think then later when Bruce became famous and, and James DeMille created his Wing Chun Do, which was obviously based on what he had learned from Bruce Lee, I think he still had some... Um, hang-ups about what is act what was actually his relationship with Bruce Lee. Mm. And um, my first instructor in Wing Chun, Sifu Johan, uh, mm -hmm. sent me a quote from James DeMille just a few weeks ago. And he's like, oh, what do you think about this? And James DeMille basically said, like, a lot of Bruce Lee's students learn from him, but they went to him, like, as if they were going to some kind of motivational speaker. And they were blown away by his speed and what he can do. Oh, man, did you see what Sifu did? Yeah. You know, I actually, I have to admit, I get kind of annoyed when I hear people uh, <laughs> talk that way after they do a martial arts class, including mine. Yeah. Like, it, sometimes you overhear students like, wow, did you see, like, well, see, you know, see if we did cheese out with that one guy, and then he was, like, tossing him around, or did you see how he hit him or how he did that thing? Like, that's okay for a little bit, but when they keep going on and on and on and on about that, yeah, I start to go, 
you realize I showed you that stuff because I want you to be able to do it. Yeah. I'm showing the things that I'm showing you are the things I want you to assimilate and be able to do yourself. You cannot come to my class and look at me like I'm a martial arts performer. Because then if you don't see yourself as being able to do any of that stuff, why are you here? Why are you here? Yeah. All right. You're coming here to learn. All right. And and sometimes I would like hear people also talk about Sifu Lang Ting like that. After I was like, oh, wow, did you see when he did this? And that? yeah, great. Awesome. Like, and we can talk about the cool things that he did. But how about, let's have a conversation about how we can do that right. now. How do we All get right? there? Yeah. And there are certain people, I think, that are like that. And sometimes those people are not very well liked. All right. Um, there, are, there are people who, when they learn from an instructor, they immediately assimilate the information that they're learning and they practice it and they think about it and they try to integrate it into what they had learned before. And they usually make progress much more quickly than the average student. And sometimes the average students look at those students and go, oh, why is that guy learning so fast? Why is that guy doing that? Because that person is not just coming to Sifu's class like a Tony Robbins seminar. Mm. That person is going like the 1% that goes to a Tony Robbins seminar and actually listens to the shit that that guy says and then does it and then also maybe become successful. And I don't know shit about Tony Robbins. I'm just saying. I insert any motivational speaker, all right? I guarantee you there's only like 5% of the people that go to those guys that actually listen, go out and do That's those so things funny. and then become successful. And the rest of the people just go there and clap with drool coming out of their mouth yeah. and go home and continue living on miserably and not getting any better. It's funny because I remember going to a Tony's Robbins seminar. And, do you have drool in your and, mouth? Yeah, and then I was like for two weeks doing something that he said in the, I was like, ah, he's just going crazy about right, right, it. Right, 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 right. And then nothing. Two, three weeks. And then, brrr. Well, not really. I, I do still do it here right. and there. Yeah. But right. it was crazy. Yeah. Was, you yeah. know who's like big into uh, Tony Robbins? Who? Dreisen. Nah. All right, next question. <laughs> I saw him at the, at the seminar too. You saw Dreisen there? <laughs> yeah. Hey, Kung Fu Genius listeners. If you're looking for an easy way to support this podcast, please consider joining the Kung Fu Genius Patreon. You can support for as little as $5 a month and get access to episodes a few days early. Higher levels of support, get additional goodies, exclusive content, and even your name in the description. The baller level of support will give you the opportunity to be a Dre for a day and give me a rest from this guy over here. A link for the Kung Fu Genius Patreon page is in the description below. You can also support us by subscribing to the Kung Fu Genius on YouTube, liking this video, and sharing it on your social media platforms. When you subscribe on YouTube, don't forget to hit that bell for notifications so you will know as soon as a new episode or a premiere is available for you to watch. For those of us who listen to us on audio, it's a huge help if you don't just rate the podcast, but also write a review wherever you listen to the Kung Fu Genius, such as Apple or Google Podcasts. I really appreciate it. And now back to me. All right. Next up, we got the panda. The panda. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Another Ask KFG. I have a few questions. Oh, here we go. We gotta, start, we gotta start limiting it to one question per person. Know how otherwise, I... you know, one person ends up getting half the yeah, damn episode. It's yeah, not fair, right? I, I, I don't know how this slipped in. Yes. But number one. All right. Can you delve a bit deeper into my question I asked about picking a WTWC school and what qualities, attributes, red flags would you look for when considering the school? I am worried about getting into a McDojo. That's the first part. All right, let me answer that question before we go on. If you're already aware enough to know what a McDojo is, <laughs> then I don't need to tell you what a McDojo is, all right? If you go there and you think it's a McDojo and you don't want to join a McDojo, then you don't join. Mm. And I, I remember answering this, and I basically said, you got to go and check out the school and see if you like it, all right? And my answer still stands because, again, very similar to the Tony Robbins thing, all right? The answer I gave was you got to go check it out. You got to see if you like the place. Like, do you feel comfortable there? Yeah. Do you like the instructor? Do you like how they teach? Do you like the way the classes run? Yes. Then join. Yeah. All right. Like, you have to do the legwork. The, the, sometimes people are looking for me to say, look, if you see this, this, and this, don't join. But maybe this and this are some things that some people might actually like or might actually enjoy. So I can't tell you that. All right. Mm. You have to go in there. Check the place out, do an intro lesson, do an intro program, see how you feel, how do you vibe with the instructor, how do you vibe with the place, and if you like it, join. And if you do it for a month and you don't like it, quit. Boy. All right? Like, I mean, like, this is this is not rock. Like, you're not going to, you're not now going to be forced to stay at this place forever. Mm. So, I mean, like, it's not that big of a deal. 
try it out. All right. Next. Interesting. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just, as you're saying that, I'm, I'm like, I've, I've done Aikido. Yeah. I've been to one Aikido school. Yeah. And that was the one I joined. Yeah. I've been to uh, maybe one JKD school. Yeah. And that was the one I joined. Yeah. And then I've been to one Wing Chun school. Yeah. And that was the one I joined. Yeah. Yeah. It's so odd. Yeah. Like I just went in knowing and then yeah. do- dove yeah. in. Yeah. You do it. You yeah. do it. Right. Hmm. And I think the problem is that we have something called option paralysis. Right. Oh, Which is damn. when when you have too many options. That Netflix shit. It's a net. <laughs> no, it's a serious problem. I, I, I forget what the number is, but it's like if you have more, I think, than five options or something like that, your brain starts to go, what's going on here? Uh, we have the same problem. I have the same problem when I go to diners. <laughs> because you know like especially okay, New yeah. York City diners yeah. they have those like 10 page menus where they basically they, yeah, it's sp- spiral bound 10 page <laughs> menus yeah. right and they basically serve every single type of food known to man the Greek and Italian yeah. food and oh, pizza and yeah. fish and everything like that and everything. I go there and I'm like I literally don't yeah. know what I just want right? egg sandwich salad. yeah and then what do I end up doing I would just get a burger yeah. at every diner yeah. I'm like yeah, I just get a burger uh, right why not so yeah it's the same it's a problem on Netflix it's a problem whenever you go to these streaming channels and you have all of these options or whatever so um i think that most people who live in a town they don't have hundreds of options for a wing chun school Mm -hmm. just go and try it out it's not that big of a deal yeah and if you find out it's a mcdojo quick go somewhere else like i I, I don't know what else to say like do you like it yeah you know and and, and like look people talk shit about mcdojos like karate schools that are mcdojos and stuff like that right but you know what of course they're terrible mcdojos out there that are just ripping you off for money and stuff like that Mm -hmm. but there's some mcdojos that specialize like in teaching kids and look you we can leave the whole whether a kid should have a black belt and like that that's a whole separate debate kind of thing right Mm -hmm. but if you look at some of the programs that they offer in some of those quote-unquote mcdojos they actually have really good programs for kids Mm -hmm. and a lot of those they have like things like Matt chats uh, where you're teaching kids like a word of the month, like responsibility, like, hey, Johnny, tell me like five ways you were responsible this month. All right. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, um, these these kind of like like they take great care to do character development for kids and to do all this kind of stuff. And those are technically McDojo's. So, like, yeah, they're ones that are just going to take your money and not teach anything. But sometimes for kids. Those type of schools are actually teaching stuff that they don't even teach in elementary schools anymore. So again, like <laughs> right. I'll tell you, oh, here's what you av- here's what to avoid in a McDojo or whatever. But like if you were a parent that wanted a kid, your kid to learn some life skills, mm. and you found a McDojo where the instructor was really conscientious about how they taught kids, and perhaps even a little bit strict on the behavior, that might be the thing you want. Yeah. All right. So, so the thing is, again, this is so subjective. I mean, what, well, I'm, I'm not going to select, uh, what, what, give criteria on what is a good school and what is not a good school because this is different for everyone. Yeah, I, f- mm-hmm. I find when I'm teaching kids that I'm learning the most. <laughs> yes. From the class. Patience. <laughs> right, right. All right. In the second part of this question, mm-hmm. what do you think about gaining inch strength by practicing the Sulem Tao? Uh, well, the Siyunam Tao form in general is done in a relaxed way because the point of the form is to teach the students to uh, to abandon their own power, select, or just to abandon your own force, to do things in a relaxed way. So the ability of your joints to be relaxed and work in a syn- synergistic kind of way is necessary for inch power because mm-hmm. you, you need to transfer the power through the joints like essentially changing your arm from being like an iron bar to being a whip, you know? So so you're using your joints in between, right? Rather than just using your arm like in one st- as one stiff, solid limb. Mm-hmm. So you learn that in Siyunam, how to abandon your own power and to articulate the joints individually. So that is necessary for inch power. But if you want to develop inch power, you got to hit something. You have to actually hit, you have to do your wall bag training. You have to do your close range punching. You have to practice punching in different kind of ways with an advancing step, stationary, with a turn, mm. with a drop step, on a wall bag, on a heavy bag, with a partner, transferring power with a palm strike. So the the ability to develop short force that comes through actual sweat equity practice, and I'm not saying you don't sweat when you do the Siyunam Tao form, but I wouldn't ascribe... Uh, the, I wouldn't say that the the secret of the inch power is solely doing the Siyunam Tao form. Mm. Because then you could do an experiment. You could teach someone Siyunam Tao only for two years. 
nothing else, and then test their inch punch at the end of those two years. All right, or you can teach someone for two years and teach them the siunam tau and teach them how to hit a wall bag and teach them how to do partner training and teach them how to do a heavy bag and test that student's inch power at the end of two years and compare the two. Wow. All right, Prov pro of course, providing you have two very similar built students of very similar quality and attributes when they started, right? Mm. Um, and even then, it's almost impossible to tell. But no, if you, the, the, you have to ask the question, if the student only did siunam tau, perfect and relaxed or in whatever kind of special voodoo mystical way that would give you inch power. His goal is to be the king. Yeah, would that student be better than a student who also hit a wall bag and practiced with a partner? And I posit, no. <laughs> All right, mm -hmm. next question. Oh, man. All right, next up we got uh, Dryson. Oh, come on. <sighs> what's wrong with that? What's wrong because with it? Because the fans are revolting. That's what's wrong with that. Like, you let all, you let good questions in. Sifu David Peterson, Voodoo from Patreon. Oh, those are great questions. He always has good questions, though. He always has questions. I wouldn't say he always has good questions. <laughs> he always has questions. The fans revolting, though. I'm sure they were very nice. No, has, no, no. I said the fans are revolted. I didn't say they were revolting. Oh. Did I say the fans are revolting? Yes. Oh, I said the fans are revolting Has. against Dryson. That's ah, what yes, I'm saying. Yeah, that's what I meant. Right, okay. Not our fans are revolting. We love our fans. Well, he has questionable questions. Questions... It's such a loose sense. Yeah, of questions are a very it's loose been term. Been there have been, been times... Where he just went on and on and on, and at the end, the questions uh, just didn't make any it, sense. It seems like it's a short question anyway. Okay. So. All right. Um, hypothetical. Shocker. You, 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 you leave, you leave uh, City Wing Chun uh, that you own, and you come out to the bottom of the staircase, and <laughs> you get to that bottom step, and your hip starts to hurt. You're like, damn. You get out the building, you start, you know, make a right, and you start walking up the block. And uh, stop telling people which way I go to the subway. I'm going to get all my weird stalkers. are going to start following this me. What, this is what he said. Oh, oh sorry. I mean, Dryson. Yeah, no. How does Dryson know? Yeah. How does Dryson know which way I walk he to the subway? He must be a student here on the low. On the low? On the low. On the real on the low. Yeah. yeah. On the liggity. If I ever find out who Dryson is, I'm going to give him an inch punch <laughs> while he's doing the siu nam tau form. <laughs> I'm just going to go up to him and go, you Dryson? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Boom. Inch punch. Yell it out. Yeah. Inch punch. Yes. Because... Like many old kung fu movies or video games, yeah. you should always blurt out the name of the movement you do at the moment you <laughs> beat moment someone you up do with it. it. Yes, yes. Horse so, kick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Donkey punch. Hey, 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 hey. What? Take it easy. No, this is a. That's a move. It's, it's a I don't think the don. I don't that's think a VT move. I don't think the donkey punch is what you think it is. All right, no, let's no. continue. This is a family so show. this is a family you get, show. You get to 39th Street. And you, you notice like your other hip is hurting all of a sudden. You're like, damn, what, what's this weird hip action? Then you get to like 40th Street. <laughs> She's going to name all the streets. <laughs> and, yeah. 39th, then 40th, then 41st. Yeah, you, yeah. you, you start to feel like your, your elbow is jacked up for some reason. You're like, what the hell, man? So you start rubbing it. And then you walk past like a, 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 a very good reflective window from a store and you see yourself you're like 20 years older what yeah it's crazy it's crazy this is what he wrote and you're like jeez what the you stop you're like what the it's like some so benjamin just, button stuff yeah some weird <laughs> you keep walking you're like ah now you got like a weird limp my god i'm like and aging yeah, tens of crazy. years every minute so basically what i'm asking i mean uh what dryson is asking is <laughs> is saying do you think Bruce Lee would have improved with age with, when much of his skills were attribute-based? What would he have done as he got older and couldn't move as well? Um, Did Dryson just ask a real question? It's, it's all here. Well, like a good question. No, like a good question. That's what he asked. Did Dryson just ask an actual legitimate question? He always asks good questions. He barely even asks questions half the time, let alone good questions. <laughs> he asks, what would you do questions in this moment? And he's asking... What? I'm blown away right now. How? Because I've never gotten a legitimate question from Dryson. This is weird. Very strange. This is very strange. Are you thrown with a bucket? 
<laughs> Is that your Shakespeare? Your hip. Yeah, yeah, hip if. Do you remember I'm going to get you, sucker? Yeah. He's a Shakespeare. He's a... <laughs> All right. He's a Shakespeare. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, wow. So would Bruce Lee have continued to improve? Because, like, his Jeet Kune Do was mostly attribute-based, attribute. right? Because he – obviously, Bruce Lee talked a lot about speed and, and you know, I, there was an emphasis on power and things like that. Mm. And is that something sustainable like as you get 70. older? 80. Well, that's a good question. I think that's what we have been robbed of not knowing mm. about Bruce Lee. Now, of course, had Bruce Lee continued to make films, like I talked about earlier, his uh, development in Jeet Kune Do, uh, or lack there, it would be interesting to see whether he would have been as interested in improving himself and his martial art, or he would have been more mm, interested in staying in shape and doing stuff that looked better in films, mm -hmm. or if he would have done 50-50. I mean, obviously, we're all martial art fans of Bruce Lee so we would like to hope that he would continue to develop his Jeet Kune Do theories and develop Jeet Kune Do maybe into something very similar to what uh, Sifu Inosanto does today maybe Bruce would have eventually you know seen the jujitsu stuff and wanted that stuff in there as well he might have been one of those freak old men yeah you possibly freak old men but, but, but the thing is we don't know he also could have just gotten weird and bloated and fat and <laughs> oh, no. divorced Linda oh, and no. been a hot mess express and Making straight to video B movies in the Fat 80s. Bruce Lee. Yeah, but you imagine like if he just like his career went down the shitter and he oh. was doing those like straight to video movies with Don the Dragon Wilson in the 90s. Oh, like, what? I mean, like that's also a potential future for Bruce Lee, you know, had he not passed away, right? Um, but let's assume that he was still interested in his martial art as such, all right? Mm. I, he would have been forced to evolve because every martial artist has to you know mm -hmm. when you get older and you're not able to do the things that you were able to do when you were younger um you either desperately hold on to the person that you are no longer stuck and, and you stuck in the 70s and and you end up just becoming a punchline and you end up uh becoming a joke and less relevant or as i believe bruce lee was i mean you know we listen to those um those uh, daniel lee conversations so we heard Bruce Lee on the phone when he, you know, didn't know he was being recorded. And he was a very hip guy mm. and he was very forward thinking. And I would like to think that Bruce Lee would have continued to develop himself. I think he was also aware of his of him aging and not being able to do the same thing. I believe he had actually even talked about that at various points. Okay. So I think that he would have evolved his Jeet Kune Do to be something that maybe did not rely solely on you know, being the fastest gun in the West because at some point there's always some young kid Damn. that comes that's faster, right? So what are you going to do against that? Um, I would like to think that he would have evolved because you either evolve or you die. Mm. And Bruce's Jeet Kune Do philosophy was ultimately about the process of evolving. So I find it very hard to believe that Bruce would have then been so vain about his once, you know, unbelievable blinding speed that he would have just hold held on to that to the point that he became irrelevant. I doubt that very highly. I think he would have continued wow. developing himself because Bruce was the first one to say that you needed to do that. Most martial arts at that time and martial artists talked about martial arts as this kind of fixed thing. You're learning this product and you are a product of the product. And Bruce didn't even like the word mature because he said that's an end position. You have to think of you are maturing because you never quite reach that. Oh, right. And, and he said that in the Daniel Lee conversation. And so, Someone who thinks that way, he obviously thinks that way about his martial arts. So the martial arts being a continual process. I mean, when you hear us talk about martial arts being a process and evolving and things like that, these are things that are taken for granted now because of things like mixed martial arts and stuff like this. But Bruce Lee was one of the first. He wasn't the only one, but he was one of the first to start talking about martial arts as an evolutionary process. Okay. Um, whereas even now traditional martial artists like myself who do Wing Chun talk about Wing Chun as an evolution and evolving our Wing Chun. Well, would we really be that open about our martial art evolving had it not been for Bruce Lee's influence? Had it not been for Bruce Lee's influence, and let's say Wing Chun still became famous the way it did, would I be as open-minded about other stuff or about Wing Chun as an evolutionary process? Or would I be more conservative about this Wing Chun is the best and the way we do it is the best? Mm. I would probably be more that way without Bruce Lee's influence. So I think it 100% would have evolved as he got older. Hmm. Awesome right. question. Well, wow, that blew me away. Well, he has a two-parter. 
He has a well, two-parter. Oh, 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 two-parter. Yeah, a two-parter. I, I'm, to ruin I'm, it. No, I, I don't think so at all. Okay. I kind of pre-read it, but um, he's asking the two-part. Do you also think uh, would he have still kept that uh, iconic upside-down teardrop haircut? Wow. Yeah. Did we almost stuck the landing. So close. And then Dryson <laughs> squatted on our plate of filet mignon and took a dump. <laughs> He's curious. Teardrop haircut. Is that upside down teardrop haircut? Up, Iconic. Upside down teardrop. Oh, you mean with the t- with the tip there, no, right? No, just the the shape of the teardrop like Bruce was a very hip dude. His yeah, hair was always it up. commensurate to the times. When you look at him in the fifties, he had like, he had like the. You right? He had like he a DA. Like, he, no, in the fifties, he looked like a teddy boy. Mm-hmm. You know, and and like one of them British teddy boys. You know, <laughs> and in the sixties, you know, in the early sixties, he had like kind of a clean cut haircut. And then as the sixties evolved, he had more of a hippie kind of thing going on. Mm-hmm. And then as the seventies. I mean, he had more of the kind of slightly longer 70s kind of uh, Beatles type haircut, right? Mm. So I'm, I'm absolutely certain that a 70-something-year-old Bruce Lee would have had a faux hawk. You, th- you think <laughs> he would have he evolved into like a uh, mullet in the 80s? No one evolves into a mullet. She's just, the mullet just straight is a de-evolution de- oh. of anyone. Oh. Okay? Whoa, 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 whoa. Take it easy. No, 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 no. No, no, the mullet. Mullet Bruce Lee. Out, the mullet never goes out of fashion <clears throat> because it was never in fashion. Ah. I had total deja vu that we've actually said this before on this podcast. Mullet Bruce Lee? No, no about the mullet never going out of fashion <laughs> because it was never in never fashion. Never in fashion. Yes. Ah. Yeah, I think in in German, in German, you call the mullet uh, Fokuhila, which is like <laughs> short <laughs> fauna, which is front. Ku, kurz. So is fo, fo is is like in the front, yeah. right? Fauna, right? So you just take the first two letters, vo, right? V O, uh-huh. and then kurz, which is short. So you just take K U from kurz, and then the back is hinten. All right, so you just take H I, and then hinten. All right, uh-huh. and then lang, which is long. So it's Fokuhila. All right. So it's like this weird short version. But if you want to go full redneck with it, yeah. because the full rednecks, even in Germany, don't only have the mullet. They also have the mustache. Yes. And 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 you can call a mustache an over the lip beard in German. <laughs> oh, wow. And the short version of that is Oliba. So you go Fokuhila Oliba. Uh. And that is the full mullet with the mustache. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. We got time for one more? I think we do. Wow, that Dryson one still blew me away. Yeah. It was a great question. And then finally, still shit the bed. Yeah. <laughs> How to ruin it, didn't Yeah. You? Oh, he never, he, he never. Why are you so defensive route? of Dryson? I don't I get f- it. I'm, I feel like he's, he's, um. In your head? Somebody we know that we just don't know exactly who. Or we might know. We might know is. exactly yeah, and I, where I, I he got is. A pretty good idea. Yeah, I got a pretty good idea. Someone we know, like, right? Like we know, no. Yes, no, no, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Next question. All right. Next up, we got the anti-hero, but spelled a little different. Okay. With the a, a seven and a one and a, and a three in a row. Okay. All right. Hey, Sifu Alex, love the podcast and made. It's a habit to listen to it on Wednesdays. Awesome. On my way to training. Okay. I have a hypothetical question. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> if it weren't for those psychedelic fever dream rising questions, how much bigger would your audience be? We would be at 50K right now. Oh! Yeah. If you, nice. did, if you didn't keep letting what? Dryson slip under the radar and ask those dumbass hypothetical questions, Yo. we'd be at like 50K subscribers right Word? now. You I'd, be so? li- I'd be living off of YouTube right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right? No, nah, but that, that Dryson shit is just point. pulling us down. Yo. This is ridiculous. Man, I got to say, respect to that question, <laughs> anti hero. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, Yo. let's go. Let, Let's go for one more question. Mm. Maybe a mm. question of some more substance. Mm. Oh, wait. He Okay. 
Uh, I, think, I like him I think scan, he has a, yeah. scanning for a, a question of substance. Yeah. The guy who yeah. lets Dryson's questions through yeah. is now scanning for a question of substance. Yeah. Every time. All right, next up we got Kelvin Dryson. I mean, Kelvin Dyson. Kelvin Dyson. <laughs> yeah. Giving me mini heart attacks here. <laughs> All right, let's go. Hey, K of, K of G, Alex. Yo. Again, love the video series with Charles Damiano. Oh, those were fun. My question is... Michael Jai White, in an interview, was asked if he thought the following individuals were fighters. Mm -hmm. Bruce Lee, Jackie Chan, Jean-Claude Van Damme, mm -hmm. Jet Li. Mm -hmm. His response was, they are not fighters, they are actors. He even said that he himself was not a fighter, but an actor. So, my question is, do you think these individuals actually had or have the ability to actually fight, including Michael J. White? Cheers, bro. It's difficult to answer this question. You know why? Why? Because I don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't give a flying shit. All right? Dang. Because, again, like going to the Tony Robbins seminar. Mm -hmm. Tony Robbins might be the motivational guy, but if you're going there to learn how to be motivated yourself, mm -hmm. you got to be able to do it. So if that guy's a fighter or not a fighter, what does that have to do with you? Ooh. Is that going to make you, is that information? If I say, look, Jet Li can't fight, all right? So do some shit with that information. He Go. can catch bullets, though. Okay, no, no. no. Jet Li, <laughs> Jet, Jet, Li, Jet, Jet Li can't fight. He's just a wushu guy who did forms. Also, his knees are all messed up now anyway, and he's old as shit, okay? Mm. All right? He can't fight. I'm going to tell you that right now, okay? <laughs> Do something with that info. Go. I'm waiting. Go. Go. Damn, all right. What, what are you going to do, do with that? It? All right. What can I do? Jean Claude Van Damme did seemingly compete competitively in, in karate in the late 70s. All right. I think he was probably not bad, but he's one of the best martial art actors that, that ever made it big. All right. Hmm. So if he could fight, how's that going to help you? <laughs> all right. Okay. Jean Claude Van Damme, really good fighter. Do something with that information. Go. Okay, Jean-Claude Van Damme cannot fight at all. Do something with that shit. Go. <laughs> all right? All right. Jackie Chan, all right? One of the most iconic martial arts superstars, the guy who essentially succeeded, succeeded Bruce Lee, mm -hmm. you know, as like the Hong and Kong stuntmen. martial art and stuntman and, and took it to a whole new level. Fuck. Has done stunts, the likes of which will never be replicated again because everything is CGI. Changed everything. When you look at Jackie Chan's films, Project A, mm. Police Story, mm. Drunken Master 2, all Operation Condor, all these movies, he, his body of work is unbelievable. All right? He, if he really needed to fight, he could kick the shit out of anyone. Do something with that info. Go. All right, you know what? Jackie Chan can't fight at all. If someone <laughs> threw a punch at him, he would fall <laughs> apart like a, like a sugar cube getting water. Do something with that info. Go. He'll, he'll be a good, like, faller if someone punched him. Yeah, Boom. but do something with that info. Go. All right? Bruce Lee, all right, had lots of fights when he was uh, coming up and was a scrappy teenage kid and was someone who understood what real martial arts were about. He understood the value of things like boxing and real training and had a very open idea about what martial arts are and sought to develop his martial arts to the highest level. And he could definitely bang. Do something with that info, go. All right? Bruce was a god of Chinese martial arts who could never be defeated by anyone. Do something with that info, go. All right. Bruce couldn't fight his way out of a wet paper bag with scissors in his hands. Do something with that info. Go. All right. Oh, 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 no. Who cares? All right. Because the most important thing about martial arts is not whether that guy can fight or that guy can't fight. If you are practicing martial arts, the only thing that matters is what does the martial arts do for you? Mm. And that might not be to be a great fighter. Maybe it's just to feel a little bit more confident so you can ask your boss for a raise. Maybe it's to feel more confident when you walk down the street so if someone does something, you at least know you can do something. Or maybe it's to gain confidence by going into tournaments and proving yourself and, 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 and testing yourself against other people, right? Or maybe it's about being a street thug and beating the shit out of everyone, okay? What martial arts are is as individual 
as snowflakes, okay? And the only thing that matters is on your own personal journey, how are you going to develop yourself? In which direction are you going to develop yourself? Why do you do your martial art? Are you learning from the people who can help you achieve those aims? It does not matter if this guy could fight, if that guy could beat up that guy, if your dad could beat up the principal at your school. None of that stuff matters. It's all hypothetical, like a dumbass Dreisen question, all right? <laughs> and it serves no purpose, even as a thought experiment. Because you could, for example, say, who would win in a boxing match, Customato or Mike Tyson in their prime? Damn, dude. Uh huh. Mike Tyson would murder Customato. <laughs> Damn, dude. Okay. Who would you rather learn boxing from? Now, some mm. people might want to learn from Tyson because he's Mike Tyson. I'd rather learn from Customato. Mm. Mm. So. The question of who the better fighter is goes to Mike Tyson. Who the better trainer is goes to Customato. So are you showing up to that Tony Robbins seminar to see what an awesome fighter Mike Tyson is? Or do you want to be a fighter yourself and maybe you want to learn from Customato? Mm. Who cares? You got to know what you want to do. And the best fighter is not always the best teacher. And the best fighter is all, not always the person who gives a shit about you or is going to inspire you. Sometimes they might be. There are great fighters out there who are also great teachers. But it's not always the case. And whether someone could win or not, would you, would you like to take a kickboxing lesson from Anderson Silva? If you had a chance to take a kickboxing lesson from Anderson Silva, would you do it? Hmm. I, would, I would 100% do yeah. it. I would 100% take a kickboxing lesson from the great spider, mm -hmm. Anderson Silva. Right. He broke his leg against Chris Weidman. So, well, he sucks, I guess. <laughs> So why would you want to learn kickboxing from a guy who broke his leg doing a kick? Yeah. All right? But you yeah. see what I mean? Of course you would want to learn from him because this guy is one of the greats. All right? Even if he lost the fight, even if there were people out there who could beat him. What is all this bullshit in martial arts about who is a fighter and who is not a fighter? It's a bunch of macho nonsense, all right? And it doesn't slip my guard that Michael Jai White goes, well, I'm also just an actor. <laughs> that he's he's trying to throw shade on those guys, and then you got the fake humility thing. Well, well, I'm also just an actor, all right? Yeah, depends on what day you ask him that question. So I don't know. Whose dad can beat up whom? Who's the toughest fighter? Who gives a shit? <laughs> and that's all I got to say about that. All right, everyone. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of The Kung Fu Genius. As always, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to The Kung Fu Genius, hit that bell for notifications, comment below any questions you want me to answer on a future episode. And if you'd like, you can support us on Patreon for as little as $5 a month. And as always, I'll see you guys next time. Word is I'm a Kung Fu genius. Technique speaks for me, not lineage. Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one. Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Si Kung. And I produce masters. You surpassed us. Your Kung Fu stiffer than corpse and caskets. City Wing Chung is the house I built. Violate the gate and your blood gets spilt. Alex Richter, always the victor. All right, peeps. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong place. Yeah, probably talking to the mic too might help. Yeah, yeah, true, true. Yeah, true you don't that. need the computer in front of you. True, true, true that. True that, Jack. I like how I got to tell him the, what to do after oh, yeah. fifth, after, <laughs> oh, si yeah. I think this is the 60th, or, yes. no, this is the 60 or 61st episode. After 60 something fucking episodes, I still got to tell this guy, you can turn the computer off when we do the outro true, and true. put the mic in front true, of true. you. We'll keep it going. All right, let's do it. We'll keep that shit going. 70. All right, let's do it. All right, peeps. On today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, so I was He's coming in hot. on that one. Yeah, yeah. aggressive. Oh, oh, Jesus. Man. All right, peoples. On today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from YouTube. Lots of gems. Lots of yo. The fuck is going on with your voice right now? <laughs> All right. Well, it's one of those Gems. things. He he started with the voice, and then like three seconds in, realized he'd have to commit to it for the whole thing. <laughs> and then as he continues to talk, his mind is going like, no. "Do you really want to do this? Do you really no. want to do this?" And then at some point, it's like, nah, "I don't want to do this." No, I didn't want to do it. Plus, I forgot what I was supposed to say. Yeah, anyway. I got a piss. That's what's happening. Yeah, did get it done. Channel that piss energy. Piss for, energy. For, all right, go for it. Just go for it. Just go raw.
Go like ODB. Go in raw. Go, yeah, let's go. <laughs> go in raw like ODB. It worked out fine for him. Let's go. Yeah, numerous times. All right, peeps. On today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from YouTube. Lots of gems. Lots of gun sound. <laughs> what? It was though the energy was good, but yeah. I knew he was going to forget the first line. Because Dre's... You know, like a video game, you have this yeah. much energy, and he was redlining, <laughs> and I go, he's eating into his memory banks with that high-level energy. Yeah. He's not going to have it left by the time he makes it there. Let's get to it. Wow. That was quite amazing. That was some piss energy right yeah. there, Dre. Good well job, done. man. Well done. Yo, go take your well-earned piss. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Look at him! Look at him go! Look at him go! Go, 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 go! Go, Dre! Yeah!